sorry i don't have time you you had people reaching out to you like giving you shit that you didn't know what wordle was from the last yeah, episode yeah i loved it what was the general feedback that you're getting old uh <laughs> yeah maybe no actually it was more so like there's actually a policy wonk that uh we have a good network with and he's just like love the episode but you don't know about wordle i was like i don't i'm not super engaged I, I mean, I'm I'm struggling to still be friends with you afterwards. I've never used Wordle in my life. I think exactly. I, said that in the <laughs> I just, but I, I know just... what it is because I have you know eyes and ears, and I listen and watch things. But that's actually what we were just saying is that we've both been a little bit busy and maybe have missed a lot of the news. So the irony of that, let's start our new show since neither of us is paying attention really to the news and right. putting our head deep in the sand. There's obviously some things going on in the international world um, that we are all aware of. And I think we're all also aware that Lindsay and I are not the people that should be commenting or having any kind of nuanced opinion on that. So we're not going to talk about that today. What we are going to talk about is something closer to home, closer to us, the Atomic Fundraise. So before we get to that, Lindsay, how are you? How have you I been since last time? I'm very well, uh, a little tired. We did have a big announcement. And to be clear, actually, there were two Atomic announcements yesterday, Atomic the Fund, which uh, they raised and closed a new fund, but Atomic Financial, which we'll get into, raised a 40 million Series B, and we announced it yesterday. It's just, it's it's raining atoms all over the place, basically. It's raining, it's well, raining atoms. Well, to not go off into that the topic that we are not well-versed to talk about, there was a Atomic plant that blew up, so... That oh, also yeah. took some of the took some of the, the news away, so it was very hard. But again, thoughts and prayers out to everybody out in Ukraine. Thankfully, yeah. we are we don't have a team member out there. But for fintech companies we work with that do, like we feel terrible for them. And there's a lot of them. I mean, I know we were going to not talk about this, but the amount of technical talent in Ukraine is fucking deep. Like I back when I was a product manager. I was building like outsourced products for Sprint and for smaller companies here in KC. And I had a uh, multiple teams that I worked with in the Ukraine and they were so good, so good. And uh, I'm sure it's impacting us technology in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. beyond what we see in the news, like the new ones, like actual shipping of code in Europe in general, right? If cut, you cut, you brush off from Swift that impacts yeah. all of, all of us and certainly crypto narratives have been top and center there is alternatives to moving currency outside of swift and yeah. it's it's a very interesting time very. and maybe we live in interesting times is, is a fucking a ain't that a statement of the day um if anybody doesn't have deep knowledge of swift by the way which i absolutely like did not and still don't um simon taylor did an awesome breakdown of it in his newsletter last week i want to say that was last week but anyways, shouts out to Simon. And if you don't know anything about Swift or you're like, what is all of this? Which if you're listening to for FinTech sake, you probably at least have some sense. Um, but he explained it in a like really interesting way. Cause I definitely always thought it was like payment rails, not a messaging system. So that no. was, that was very yeah. cool to learn. And I had no idea. I worked at DTCC. So Swift was a, so you knew. Mechanism. Yeah. But I knew, is, I knew about is, the messaging side of things. Yeah. You also generally are aware of how oh, like i'm confused still about how you know the technical shit you know like i'm like how do you find the time to understand these things the arc of my career is not standard it is a jungle <laughs> it's a jungle gym not a ladder it's a roller coaster not an arc fair enough yeah yeah <laughs> and the roller coaster my friend the highs are high right now the highs are high and highs are highs uh, lows are lows lows are lows lows are lows, lows, are lows. lows, are lows. lows are so lows. one of the reasons we do this on fridays before we get into the fundraise stuff is because you do fintech fridays on fridays hence the name mm -hmm. um and i'm generally running all over the place and don't make it into fintech fridays so i get to selfishly just get you to give me a little update so what did you talk about today and also, oh. uh, I don't know if we've ever done this on air before. So what is Fintech Fridays for folks that maybe would want to tune in? Well, it is a bunch of payment and fintech nerds, very similar to you and I, that get together to host a conversation with an entrepreneur that's building something in the fintech and or crypto space. We did a big series at the top of the year talking about DAOs, ICOs, NFTs. And then today we talked about fraud and fighting fraud and how do you use new forms of authentication and biometrics. And the guest today was Soups, the CEO and co-founder of Sardine. 
My so, dude, the sardine soup himself. I love right? soups. Right? I wonder yeah. if he intend. I was like, sardine soup sounds terrible, but no, kinda, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to forget it. Yeah, I don't think I, – I, somebody the other day, we were talking about him, and they were like, oh, he's the CEO of Sardine. And I was like, yeah, you don't have the memory mechanism of sardine soup in your head automatically the first moment you met him? Like, yeah. That's just how it works. Yeah, exactly. And their growth has been incredible. They announced their Series A from Andreessen Experian and uh, – with participation from NICA last month. And since then they've added another 20 customers and they're they're growing pretty wildly without any outbound marketing because we had actually chatted about marketing people and if I knew anybody that could help them scale. But the organic in the beginning and very similar to Atomic is when you solve a really hard pain point it's that's felt acutely for founders, the yeah. gravitational pull from, from them for your product, you don't realize until you're on the other side of it, where people are ripping it from you, it's breaking and you're patching things. And that's a good thing because they continue to stay on as customers because they believe in you and want to fight the fight with you. But it also just speaks to you're solving a real problem. And that is what they have been able to build. So be, being able to open a consumer bank account and fund it is one of their primary use cases, one of ours, ironically. But how do you move money in a digital world where you don't have the ability to authenticate them in a branch? Also, you've got money moving into crypto wallets and crypto companies that don't do the same level of AML KYC that a bank does. So his whole platform, and he had built this off of his knowledge of having fought fraud for Revolut and for Coinbase and seeing consumer behavior there. He said, oh, I can train an algorithm to, to monitor the behavior of a consumer and then help fight that fraud in real time, such that if somebody were to break, break into one of our accounts because they had our credentials, and most banks don't have two-factor authentication enabled, you would not necessarily let them in if you're using Sardine's product because you would have noticed how quickly they type their password or things that aren't right. And if a fraudster is just you know, pulling from a list, there'll be a lot of behavioral differences in the way that you traditionally log in to the way that the fraudster is trying to log in. So really awesome growth and success there. And we had him last Friday. And the next Friday, we're actually going to have Scott and Jordan come on. So I'm really excited to have co-founders. I, I think the dynamics and the stories there are always beautiful. Uh, today, we did have one of the starting co-founders, but Twitter Spaces wasn't really working for us. Um, hopefully, uh, Riverside will serve us better. Yeah. And I love the soups thing. The So was it, it was, the whole thing was just like an interview with soups, basically, and just talking about like fraud in general and that kind of so thing? The, yeah. So the conversation is traditionally a mix. The audience is uh, people that know fintech and the people that might be just curious about what's going on because they follow a bunch of us on Twitter. The sure. first conversation is, what is your origin story? How did you get into this? Talking about the founder's background, talking about what it's unique about their product, their go-to-market, and then drilling into how are they differentiating in certain spaces where it's crowded or what do they think the vision of the future is? We open it up at the halfway mark for Q&A. A lot of people send them directly to us for the back channel because for some reason, they don't want to come up or they're driving. Um, I got a, I've got a lot of fun ones. I took one call when I was driving to the Keys, and so I would submit my questions to be safe, of course, and not to crash the car because I'm not the best driver. I'm from Florida. I'm self-admitted. <laughs> Florida woman. Can't take I am, I'm a Florida. Hey, I made it to and from the Keys, and I did a FinTech Friday on the road, so I, it, it's possible. But we like to have a conversation to your point. And that's what we do here. And I think that that's the best style of content because it is something that's relatable. And it's, we ask the questions that people want to ask. And we also have no hubris around it. A lot of the crypto conversations, I was not as active because I don't have a horse in that fight, but we have super active crypto enthusiasts and you are among them. So you should have probably just taken my spot and hopped in. That's we've also had, we've also had the Money 2020 women join us. We had Scarlett on. And yeah, she and helped Keisha and Rachel, right? Last, last yep. year. Yeah. Yep. I thought it would be a good way to close out what was a very packed conference season until December when we all shut back down again. But now we're back. We are. We're back. So so we, we, we toy with the format, but we find that just having entrepreneurs unpack their story in a real live format versus doing the recording and then depending on who you're doing the podcast with, that news might already be stale because FinTech is moving so fast, right? We talked in December or sorry, we talked at the top of February. I've, we just closed our series B. That's how fast things move. Yeah. That's, uh, that, candidly that round, <laughs> candidly that round was closed, but I, I figured there was uh yeah, there were, there were some things that were already done there. I mean, was it, let me ask the first question about it. So for the context for listeners, well, first things first, shout out to FinTech Fridays, shout out to soups, shout out to sardine. 
holla 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 now that we put a we put a holla holla bow on that let's move on to the fundraise so, holla back holla back if you're interested in anything we just discussed following <laughs> forward um so listeners i specifically have done my due diligence to know nothing about the fundraise and nothing about what we're going to talk about other than the funding amount, which I saw in the, in what Lindsay sent me, which was $40 million. I proceeded to read nothing else so that I could ask all the first principles questions. So first things first in the world that we live in today, uh, pretty much every round that I've heard of, if they want to say it or not has been preemptive. Was this preemptive? Was this yes. like, how did this come about? Tell me like the, the formation of this, at least a little bit. Yeah, it was a, a preemptive round. Our new investor, Mercado, and Brian Sanders, who will be joining the Atomic Board, came to came to us. They have had a deep relationship with Jordan and Scott. They were previously co-founders, as you know, of Unbill, a business that they eventually sold to Q2. And Brian and, and Jordan have had a great relationship and they wanted to work with us. And in our market, payroll connectivity, we've seen a lot of interest, not only from investors, but also customers. So we've grown quite quickly. When we launched in December of 2020, we had about five customers using our first live product deposit, the ability to switch a consumer's deposit from, say, a high fee bearing account to a no fee bearing account, then have built out use cases within that functionality, such as fractional deposit switch to fund things either as a percentage or a fixed amount, and then verify, which is the ability to verify consumers, you know, employment data, income data built out drive data points to help consumers that don't have a credit history be able to qualify for financial products. And the use cases have just got grown and expanded quite quickly. So when we had announced the Series A back in October, we were already at a pretty healthy, you know, we had a lot of runway and, and when they wanted to come work with us, it was also an uncertain time in the economy right before we all got hit by COVID again in December. And now we have interesting global challenges and interest rates rising. So it, this ethos that that Jordan has instilled upon me is you raise money when it wants to be raised. And it's something that he said on, on your podcast and yeah. they are the right partners for us. And then of course our existing investors, Greylock, co-led the investment, core innovation capital, Portage, ATX venture partners, they all came, came to the table and said, we want to be a part of this. Let's continue. And so that is really just an incredible feeling. They are very, ride or die atomic they're value add investors they all gave me a lot of incredible feedback as we were you know iterating on the series b and like what the story was behind this round and the growth just in this market for most fintech companies has been exponential and it seems like a fast follow-on but it is the right time for us and we are going to go into new products and new use cases and hopefully continue to build a best-in-class customer success team yeah i mean I guess I guess it feels fast, but also at the same time, it doesn't like thinking back to that, that interview that I did with Jordan, that conversation that I had with Jordan. He did that. Ah, I just smacked myself in the face with my microphone. Everybody, we're fine. Um, he did. He did say raise the money when it wants to be raised. But also another piece of that conversation was that he was getting term sheets that were, you know, twice as big, three times as big as the one that he accepted for the Series A. And from what I, I haven't caught up with them in a little while, but from last chat and just knowing, you know, chatting with you occasionally, like, it's not like people aren't trying to give money to Atomic. So I'm sure that there's, there's a piece of it where like, you could have raised a lot more in that first round and maybe set this off a little further, but also you kind of probably did the right thing for shareholders by just doing a, a getting in an evaluation that wasn't totally bonkers and then you know proving out peeling back the layer of the onion and then taking the next step as you are now which and somehow we live in a world where 40 million dollars is almost like not a gigantic amount of money somehow it is a huge it personally is a huge amount of it's money it's fucking huge it's fucking it's huge but somehow we live in a world where like a 40 million dollar raise is like you know it's to your, not as to your big point as some to your point, there was a Series B done at a billion a couple of weeks ago, and it's a very early stage company. So the rounds, valuations, and the size of rounds are not in line with what you one used yeah. to traditionally believe is the size and right. stages. And but I think I, from a financial standpoint, like you do need to have revenues. You do need to have customers. Yeah. You do need I'm to saying. have a, a working business saying. model. Yeah, do. I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is a small round. I'm saying this is a rational round. And the thing that I actually have liked- It's also a rational valuation to your point. Um, yeah. 
from the perspective of not only the investors, but the early employees that join this organization, they will have real skin in this game. To, to take a valuation at a 500 or 1 billion at a series B, like I am challenged to believe that that company is going to get bought such that the early stage employees will have any upside unless they were earlier. But even then the tax capital gains tax, if you exercise, depending on if you have ISOs or NSOs oh, yeah. or RSUs, there's a lot of complexity here. So for any company that's fighting for talent in this market, you really should lean into doing what's best by your employees. And Jordan and Scott have always done that. Which is contradictory to a lot of what you hear in. It's contradictory I... to what you actually see done. A lot of founders yeah, say that. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe a lot of founders say, say that, but yeah. then there's always, you know, the aftermath. Like we work in particular is a terrible example where early employees got absolutely nothing. Yeah. It's a terribly shares... great example. It's a perfect example. That's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And it ha the, the, it happens and it's it's incumbent upon early stage employees to educate themselves, but there's not a lot of good so there, there is a, there is a lot of good knowledge out there. Well, the Wealthfront blog in particular, because Andy Radcliffe was the founder of Benchmark and then he is the co founder of Wealthfront, he had yeah. written a lot about it to help his own employees because they're also a wealth management platform. So it's just doing right by the employees. But you have to go want to understand that yourself, talk to tax accountants. It's, Ask the hard questions. Also, ask the dumb ones. I ask Jordan dumb questions all the time. Yeah, I had like I've seen I've seen the paper math, but I'm like, can you can you walk this through me? Can we whiteboard this? Can we unpack this a little bit further? But you have to ask, what was the last fair market value of the company? What is the current strike price of these shares? What is the fully diluted valuation of the company? Like these are things that employees should feel empowered to ask. And I think when I joined CB Insights at the time from DTCC. I was just happy to be a part of the organization. I just was so giddy that I could be at a startup. I didn't think I had a right to ask those types of things. Mm -hmm. I think most people don't and not even that it's not even a matter. I think in a lot of, especially for men, I don't think it's a matter of the right to ask, you know, we're generally mm -hmm. like, Oh, we have the right for everything. So I, I think it's not knowing what to ask, you know, to your point about the benchmark or not about the benchmark blog, but the Wealthfront blog, like, not knowing the questions to ask and especially outside of Silicon Valley. Like if you don't live, well, I guess what Silicon Valley is now basically SF, but if you don't live in the Bay area, you're not growing up talking about option value. You know, you're not <laughs> growing up talking about like the exercise window, right? Like, right. And, and especially like coming from startups in Kansas city, like I fucking, I had to just go figure that shit out, you know? Right. And, and, and a lot know, of that is learned the hard way. Yeah. And that's even true in New York, I think too. I don't think that it's even, I mean, the financial capital of the world in so many ways, but the level of knowledge about public markets compared to the understanding of, like I said, option value or exercise window or all that is just like entirely entirely different um and coming back to the initial, it's opaque it's intentionally opaque it's intentionally opaque for sure and and it's a hard decision it's emotional too like when you leave a company and you have to make that decision about exercising or not it's definitely not just you know does this make sense on paper it, you know there's just the amount of variables that go into it like i had to make this decision recently and it wasn't a light decision and i think i made the right decision um but you know you never really know it's, it's very personal it's, it's very very, very personal pers it's very personal and so much of it does i think have to do with potentially the hubris associated with those valuations to some degree absolutely but as we always identify we're not experts in certain things talk find a good tax accountant <laughs> Oh finds, yeah. Yeah. As if, well, I mean, that's like, what I was literally talk to saying. experts. Yeah. Was, yeah. For me, it was an emotional decision after having talked to experts that were like, that math makes no sense to me. So, you know, it's the other thing is like, yeah. if, if you're talking to a financial advisor or something like that in Kansas city and you explain to them that, you know, you have an option to purchase a, a, a piece of equity in a company that's valued at uh, let's let's use very fake numbers so that I can't be held accountable for anything I'm saying. Uh, uh, valued at a billion dollars, but has twelve dollars in revenue. That that that's well, a walk. I'm, that's a walk. Well, but but in some cases that shit works out. I you know, it's like I didn't know you worked at Theranos. Uh, no, I worked at Magic Leap uh, back in the day, <laughs> and uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but it, seriously though, I mean, it's like you have to live in certain geographies for people to even understand the idea of like. Okay, yeah, this seems insane, but based on Travis Kalanick running it, stick with it or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's hard. It's hard. 
anyways, anyways, moving along. So what are these next steps? So we've got $40 yeah. million. Dollars. Let's talk use of funds. Ultimately, it is to build out the financial infrastructure to enable people to save, manage, and invest across different financial services and products. We empower them to unlock their paycheck. The data behind it is super rich and has otherwise not been tapped before, centrally, centrally at first, but also across different payroll systems, employers, state lines. The interoperability of data is sorely lacking, not only yeah. in financial services, but again, we've talked about it in the past, content. You can't stream something you have to find out you have to rewatch there's a lot of complexity in this space we believe that creating a central point of access reducing that friction and also building out new ways of authenticating into systems so we unlocked uh, launched rather uplink last week and it is a ability to access your payroll account without the credentials ever leaving your device so atomic will never engage with them so it is leveling up security in line wow. with the expectations of what you would say OAuth is one of the first pillars there. Yeah. So we have really tried to think about what does this look like long term for consumers? How do we actually reduce friction and build trust? And this is something that I think was not the same issue back when the aggregators were going to market when you were trying to get access to your bank accounts people would just flippantly sign into them. And I think that that dynamic has changed, especially in 2022, especially in the height of all of the fraud that happened during COVID across multiple different financial services, whether that was in the payroll space where people were trying to steal the unemployment benefit checks or trying to get access to this government stimulus checks. Like there was a lot of fraud and we were able to prevent that fraud, at least for our customers, but then have also taken it to the next step because one of our potential customers brought this issue to us where they want to reduce the friction, but also eliminate the risk. Because in fintech, especially with following my conversation with Sardine, consumers are not always authentic. And so they will sign up for these things that will hop around and preventing and mitigating that fraud is very important to maintaining losses, especially if you're in the lending space and you're doing consumer lending, like that money is precious. You're not a bank. You don't just print it. Yeah. So for us, it's so about strengthening our core competency, making it better for customers, and then also building out new use cases. The ability to pay off debts out of your paycheck, which is in turn good for everybody that's in the in the system because the lender is getting access to a source of funds. It, it shows a willingness to repay. It is also access to the data that shows you income, you know, salary, career projection. There are elements within the paycheck that you can't derive from a bank account. And so unlocking that market is is probably next for us, as well as the ability to tap into earned but unpaid wages outside of a traditional EWA. So if you were working today with a employer, you could then call it EWA. But if you're working outside of that, something like a Bridget or an Earnin does income smoothing in between, that's technically lending. And that's how the CFPB will likely regulate it. We're still waiting right. on that guidance. Outside of that, what if you could tap into the payroll system to see time worked, time and attendance data, also that the person has been employed, they're pretty legitimate, but their employer today doesn't offer EWA as a benefit. You could democratize access to that by bringing it outside of the system. Which, uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So to, to your point, like some, a couple companies are doing this in certain ways already, but what you're saying- I think financial like, institutions could offer it yeah, as a benefit. So building it actually as a piece of infrastructure that becomes a kind of accepted ubiquitous thing in the world. That is an interesting, interesting way to think about the world. And you know, the caveat of that for me personally is to offset charging for overdraft fees and actually adding right. a service. It's just, it, you're creating and gendering goodwill. It's a benefit that we already know is proven to increase employee retention. Employees are often seeking it out now. Employers are desperate to find new benefits to retain their employee base and attract new ones. They're, they're upping the salaries, they're upping the 401ks, but they're finding new ways to compete in the most competitive job market on the planet, which was not the same for you and I when we were coming out of school, but... <laughs> That's, a, that's an I just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I switched from DTCC to, to, to a startup, I had to have my salary. That is not what's happening in this market, but that's okay. It's a, it's a learning, learning mechanism and I wouldn't change that. it for the world. Yeah. I, didn't, I hadn't thought about that. I've been feeling really bad for, for folks coming out of college or, or like, you know, missing their senior year of high school or 
you know, whatever right now. A lot of those come, a lot of those kids got to build their businesses, play in crypto, trade game stock. Yeah. Stop. Game stop stock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And their life went south. They YOLO'd. Um, Like, I do feel bad in terms of the mentoring relationships that they missed out on, but they're so digitally connected to begin with. Like they probably would have had those relationships online anyways. And if anything, it brought more mentors to the table because most people didn't communicate over Zoom. I loved doing Zoom calls as an analyst because I couldn't travel. I was in New York. I'd want to talk to people in San Francisco. I'd be like, and if you're okay to like FaceTime or Zoom, these, I would call it VC, video chat. And now it's, now it's common. Most people are okay to communicate that way. But prior to that, it was like kind of awkward to ask them. It's like, oh, like, yeah, let's hop on a call. I'm like, would you want a video chat? It, you're right. It was it was almost like asking somebody to go steady or something. Yes, exactly. It felt like I was asking. I was if I I asked for it, it felt like I was asking them for a date or something. I was like, can I? This would be nice to see you. I'm much better in person. I promise. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And yeah. so that 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 pendulum has swung in some really weird ways too. Where like I've seen it, like people, are, some people are like, I value my sanity. I'm never turning my video on again. And other people that you know just always. Anyways, it's totally separate. Let's go back to the fundraise. So, one of the questions that I have about your market that I don't understand totally. And obviously there's a lot of overlap between like the way that the plaids of the world kind of work infrastructure wise mm-hmm. and the way the atomics of the world work infrastructure wise plaid has and had and has uh, the issue of these thousands of banks. Right. And a big part of why they need so many engineers is to build the automation into the banks and avoid screen scraping everything. And like, you know, actually well, they also need pipes. access to the APIs. Correct. And they need the pipes to actually maintain and work. And that's not something that a small group of engineers generally can do. How much of that is true in the payroll market? Like, are there, I, I don't know how many payroll providers there even are. And I'm guessing thousands, like thousands, There's thousands. Okay. Yeah. some people have a payroll system for their own solo entrepreneurship. So SMBs that are one to two employees, sole proprietors, they run their own payroll. And then that's kind of why you've seen the rise of this embedded payroll system. So the checks of the world and the, yeah. so our, honestly, the, the 450 integrations that we have and maintain today covers 75% of the workforce. So ADP in particular, that covers one in that covers yeah. one in six. But within ADP, there's five different infrastructures because they've acquired businesses over time. And people also white label these solutions. So trying to map out the portal. So say you are using a white label solution of ADP because you work at a different organization, but the front end looks like your employer, the the end employee, oh, so the consumer that we liaise with via their financial app doesn't necessarily know who they use. So building out that mapping is something that Plaid didn't have to necessarily do because you're just going direct. Who is your bank? We're asking either who pays you or we're asking who your payroll system is. And then in the case of unemployment, if they're an unemployed worker, what state are you in? What state unemployment? And not every and the complexity here is within financial institutions, most of them have an API. It's not made public because in this country we do not have open banking such that europe has and right. requires the banks to open up their apis to third-party developers and you can get certifications and so forth we are working on that in this country via you know the cfpb and the executive order that we've chatted about in the past but without that regulation companies like plaid have had to take creative tactics to get access to this financial data that is otherwise the consumers and so the ethos there is the banks had long believed it was their data and that the plaids of the world were extracting it when really they were acting on behalf of the consumer. And that is ultimately the consumer's right to access their financial data. And that fight is being actively fought today. But again, it's something that the banks couldn't stop. They could cut off the API, creating friction for the end consumer, which in that scenario, as a consumer, I would just go complain. I would go yep. lodge a complaint. And if you file a dispute against a merchant, that mer- if you tell that merchant, they're probably likely to refund the money. They don't want that. And then banks don't want that either. Fast right. forward to 2022 slash 2021, those same banks are now investing in the space, which we did chat about, I think, in one of our previous podcasts. But the point is, Sounds they've right. now recognized the inevitability of, of financial infrastructure, and it has also made drastic improvements for them. What also separates us outside of you know being a lot messier is that we're not extracting a relationship from a payroll provider. We're actually augmenting their ability to service their end end consumer. Oh, they treat their That's interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah. We're not switching their payroll system. Yeah. The incentive mix is very different. That's true. Yeah. We are we are creating what could otherwise potentially be viewed as a more sticky relationship. 
Yeah, it actually it reminds me now that I think about it, like a lot of the retirement world. Like when I was working at Bloom, uh, well, so specifically in held away four hundred one k accounts, right? Because of the the nature of the employer being the key piece of it. It's like a fidelity for like Cerner is a big local company, right? With thousands and tens of thousands of employees. They had their own like Cerner portal to get into Fidelity, right? Versus mm -hmm. like a lot of, you know, 20 person companies that partner with Fidelity for their 401k. You just go to fidelity.com backslash 401k or whatever it is. And just like the, the ways in, there were like 75 different ways to break Fidelity and we would generally find a way to do it. Um, but then on top of that, there were, you know, 400 other custodians that we were trying to build automation for but shit, yeah it's it sounds very 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 similar and very 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 painful in a lot yeah. of situations so yeah I, in I that scenario anything. i wouldn't understand yeah. why you wouldn't want to hire somebody in the infrastructure space to kind of help you fix and maintain that but well don't get me started on on that we don't need to we don't need to go back into into how technology could have been built differently in the past to make it more valuable uh but that being said at least you're building technology in a way that it's going to be valuable and add value to the world in the future. Uh, so fucking Hope A. Congrats. That's, Thank that's you. the takeaway. Let's Thank you. go. Well, I want to tell you a fun story if we still have time. We got oh, time. I, hold on. Actually, I'm a touch late for something. But <laughs> uh, oops, that happens sometimes. I, I'm not editing this out. So whoever it is that you're late for, if they listen to this, are going to hear you say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm terrible. It's actually about my development, to be quite honest. I'm in 2022. I want to level myself up as a leader. So I've been spending time working with a coach and it is something oh. that is important to me. So pushing it off again, you can't find time you make time Correct. and so this is something i will do next but uh, as a closing thought the thing that honestly is the most valuable thing about this series b that happened organically when i was in fort lauderdale florida buying my 96 year old grandfather a new computer at best buy i was wearing it i was i was late because i'm always late i'm running in between things all the time and i was wearing my atomic shirt and the gentleman that was helping us select a new computer said why do i know you and I thought maybe he had seen us on Instagram and he said, oh yeah, and I'm very excited because our, our digital marketing manager, Alex, and I just launched our Instagram efforts. And he said, no, I think it's something else. I know what it is. I used you. It blew my mind. I was, how, how would you notice my logo? How would you have known that you used us? Because again, right. we're embedded within a, yeah. a Neobank experience. And he takes his phone out. He shows me his neobank. And there we are, Atomic, at the bottom. And he said, yeah, I switched my direct deposit from my old bank to my new bank. And getting my paycheck two days early was a game changer. And, oh, yeah, getting my tax return. That was amazing. And I just was stunned. And then I did the math. The odds were 11% based on that we had 17.88 million consumers in 20. 21 of entering atomic flow and i was in fort lauderdale florida and based on our coverage of course i did the math but i'm sitting there and my grandfather's like what's going on i said grandpa because he's an engineer they used our technology and he's like that's amazing and of course i had you know he's like oh, i love your i love your pin and your design and all your stuff and i was like take it please <laughs> But it was That's a, amazing. That must have been like emotional. Oh my gosh! It was. I mean, there's obviously some selfies. There's a video. I just, I was just so touched in that we say that we want to help the most vulnerable members of society, and there Andres is like helping, you know, a little hoity-toity girl from New York that believes very deeply in the efficacy of financial services, and her 96-year-old grandfather buy a computer, and being very stern about what it needs to have, and it just livened me up and it just brought home the value of what we're doing and our mission. And it's really hard to see that as a B2B company and bringing that back to the company and just letting them all know that like, this is really an opportunity to do the best works of your lives. If you truly do believe in this mission. And that's the first thing I hear. I'm like, how did you hear about Atomic? And they tell us that the vision and the mission really stuck with us, stuck with them. And that kind of stuff is why we all do it at the end of the day. I love it. 
the that impact. Makes me so happy. Right? It's just the warm sense. and fuzzies. Um, yeah. I that wish I could find more of that in the world, to be quite honest. Um, well, you live on a mission and around it. I mean, it's like I, I introduced Jordan to, a, and I won't go into details here because it's, I even I kind of feel weird saying this. Um, but I introduced Jordan to a friend and, or to a, a close friend. And they were having a conversation and the person asked Jordan, like, you know, why do you, why do you do what you do? Like, I'm just kind of trying to understand him a little bit more. <laughs> and he went and went on to tell a story about how he saw this family in an airport at one yeah. point, you, you know, the airport story, I, I'll butcher it. So I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but basically like long story short, that there was a family that he was able to help monetarily and like the impact. They had nowhere to go for Christmas. So he invited them over and gave them all their presents and it was, yeah. That's your CEO. So yeah. I can understand why I He's can a understand. Good person. Yeah. He is a good person. And one of my favorite parts about you all as a company and about, well, obviously, you know, I love you, but like as about you all as a company more holistically is like you find a way to make infrastructure human and you find a way to bring all of this esoteric API oriented shit that we talk about and that we take for granted and that we're like, you know, deep in actually matter to somebody and actually matter to the world. And I just, it, 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 get, it inspires me to like continue to give a fuck about this industry and to, can you, to na- continue to try and make a difference in it. So anyways, this is officially too much of a love fest. Um, I'm not comfortable anymore. We need to be meaner to each other. And uh, that's all I got. No, that's I'm terrible way to end. It's Friday. I think, I think our investor, Ryan Sanders, said it best. There's an ability to do good by people as well as do well as a company. And those things are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that uh, I think that we're coming to a place in the world where you know, I mean, if if there's any if there's any goodness that's coming out of cancel culture, maybe it is that you know, maybe it is the idea of just like holding holding people and companies to a higher standard, and hopefully, cancel culture changes the way that it handles everything. Um, but maybe that's the positive, you know, maybe that's where some of this, some of the silver lining is. I'm optimistic. Ever the optimist. It was lovely to see you. I'm going to go work on myself. All right. Go, go, uh, go improve, go improve. Uh, Constant.